Hi, good day and welcome to another session put on by the Ministry of Agriculture where we try to highlight some of the works that is being done at, in different sections of the ministry. Today again we'll be dealing with things that happen in the research division, things that you may not know that is taking place, but at the end of the day very important for our country. So today we'll be talking about Tutor Absoluta and it's an awareness session. So I'm going to share my screen. Today's session, like I said, is on Tutor Absoluta or what we call Tomato Leaf Miner. Now, we have leaf miners in Trinidad, but this is a species of leaf miner that we do not have in Trinidad. So we are doing an awareness session. Should you pick it up in our country, it's something that you need to report to the Ministry of Agriculture. So my outline, so that you will have a guide what we are doing. I'll be talking a little bit about the research division, the unit itself, what it's made up of and its function so that we get a good picture of what really the research division does for the Ministry of Agriculture and the country as a whole. Then we'll talk about what is tuta absoluta. We'll talk about where the pest is at present, the life cycle of it, and most importantly, we'll be talking about the symptoms of this pest. As you can see in my picture on the side here, these are just some of the symptoms. And we'll also be talking about what is the ministry doing to prevent the entry of it into our country what action plan is in place and most importantly what can you do to prevent this pest from getting into our country now for those who have um, visited our research division who have passed along the area where the research division is that's at the north bank Carony north bank road centeno that's behind the airport some people refer to it you will see these flat buildings and Normal local people language, you might say, what these people is really be doing, right? So this is a little insight on what we do. Now the research division is made up of three main units. We have the soil science unit, the crops unit, and the crop protection unit. Those are the three main units of the research division, and they are all headed by a director. Now the crop protection unit is further divided into di in different sections. So you have the entomology section, the pathology section, plant quarantine section, and then you have the national plant protection inquiry point. And they are all headed by the deputy director of the research division. Now the main function or the roles of the crop protection unit are some of these. These are just some of it. Diagnosis of, of plant pests. And when we talk about plant pests, we refer to pests and diseases and we conduct research in entomology and pathology and develop integrated pest management protocols. We'll deal a little bit more about integrated pest management as we go along in this presentation. We also offer training to frontline staff of the ministry in entomology, pathology and management of plant health problems. We provide a national diagnostic service through the process of our diagnostic labs, plant clinics, exhibitions, and we also do farm visits. So should you have a problem out in your field, you can contact us and we arrange and we do visits as well and recommend management strategies. We also do monitoring and controlling or control of the movement of plants and plant-based products into and out of our country via trade. So we play a big role when it comes to trade. To continue some of the main functions and kind of um, summarize, we do pest surveillance activity. And today's session is exactly that. We are doing surveillance activity for tutor absoluta. We do something called pest risk analysis. And for those who have been following um, these Facebook Live, one of our sessions was on pest risk analysis. It's a process where you need to do before you are able to get an import permit to bring in plant-based products into our country legally and that's the keyword here this is the legal process of how it is done 
like I said, we also do um, plant health diagnostics. We compile commodity pest lists, which you, is used in Trinidad and also different parts of the region. We do something called duty-free concession, um, issuance of import permits and phytosanitary certificates and other activities as well. So these are just a snapshot of some of the duties that is done by the Crop Protection Unit of the Ministry of Agriculture. Now, we have been doing a number of awareness sessions over the past few months, and some of you all may wonder, why are we doing these awareness sessions when the pest is not in our country, right? Now, routinely, you have the plant health directors, Caribbean plant health directors, they routinely will sit together and based on research, together with other organizations, they come up with what is called priority pest lists for the region. So on this list, we'll have pests that may or may not be in the region. So when we talk about the region, we're talking about the Caribbean. So this pest list will apply not only to Trinidad, but also the Caribbean countries of the region. And the major goal is to prevent the entry, or if you already have it in your country, to reduce the spread of this pest while facilitating trade. Now, like we say, trade will take place with commodities, plant-based products, but there are things that have we put measures in place to prevent it from getting into countries where you do not have the pests. And if it is already in the country, measures are put in place to prevent it from spreading further within our country. So that is how we come up with a priority pest list. And these are just some examples of the pests that were on that list. So tomato leaf miner or tuta absoluta, this is what we are talking about today. Some of my colleagues did the other topics um, in the past, Fusarium wilt, which is TR, or referred to as TR4. It's a disease in bananas and plantains. Frosty pod disease, that's something, a disease in cocoa. Lethal yellowing, a disease in um, palms, coconuts. Citrus leprosis and citrus canker, and there are others. Now I must mention this list here, none of these pests and diseases are in Trinidad. Right, but surveillance activities are taking place to pick up if we may have it, and if we don't have it, ways of preventing it from entering our country. But we do not have these pesto diseases in our country. So our session mainly today is to talk about tuta absoluta. And this is what the pest the pest looks like. Now it's blown up here, it's not that large, thank God. It is very tiny, almost like a mosquito, size of a mosquito. So you can barely see it with your naked eyes. But what you see is usually the damage caused by this pest. Now it's an insect, a moth that belongs to the Lepidoptera family, the same family that belongs to butterflies, that butterflies belong to, sorry. And some of the common names that people will call this tuta absoluta, they will call it tomato leaf miner, tomato leaf worm, or South American tomato pinworm. Now, these are terms that especially tomato farmers will be familiar with pinworms and the effects they have on your produce. Now, tuta absoluta is a serious pest of tomato and other solanaceous crops. And when we talk about solanaceous crops, the crops that belong to this family, they are melongin, peppers, whether it's sweet pepper, hot pepper, pimentos, an Irish potato, what we locally call alu, not sweet potato, normal potato, white potato that we eat is called Irish potato. So they all belong to the solanaceous family and this pest attacks these crops. The larvae stage of this pest feeds on the inner tissues of the leaves, stems, tender shoots and mature fruits. So basically, this pest feeds on every single part of your plant, whether it's from seedling, a seedling plant, a stage, growing plant, mature plant, green fruits, ripe fruits, right? And the, once it's attacked on, once it attacks your plant, you get reduction in yield, fruit yield that is, you get um, plant growth is reduced as well, and also your produce is unmarketable, as we will see some of the pictures later on. Now, where has this pest been reported? So far, tomato leaf miner is present in most South American countries, 
including Brazil, Colombia, and very close to us here, Venezuela. And we highlighted Venezuela there because you will see just now that this pest can move with the wind and also migrants coming in at, from different areas into our country. They can also come in like that. So it's in Venezuela, very close to us. It is also present in Central America, Europe, the Mediterranean, North and West Asia, and throughout Africa. This pest is doing devastation in Africa. If you search online for some of those um, reports and pictures in Africa, you will see it's like acres upon acres, like a fire pass through, how bad it is. And it's total um, about 100% losses that they get. In the Caribbean, we have it in Haiti as well. But like I mentioned from the beginning, Tuta Absoluta has not been recorded to be present in Trinidad, right? But we need to look out for it. Now, um, this pest, like I said, the damages that it cause, causes, it damages tomato plants by piercing into the buds, shoots, leaves, flowers, and fruits. They feed in the inner tissues, leaving transparent mines. So you will see these transparent or white mines on the leaf. And then over time, these white lines or the mines usually turn brown and necrotic. We will show you pictures a little later as we go along as well, right? When it comes to the fruit, you get boreholes and mines under and around the sepal area. Now the sepal area is those little leaves that you get on the top of the arm um, of the fruit. Now this picture, look at, you will see some of the symptoms on the fruit. Now this, uh, these are symptoms that you normally don't see on tomato fruit. It affects the fruit and makes it unmarketable and in terms of losses from 80 to 100 percent losses so should we get this pest in our country we could it could actually wipe out our tomato industry and we know the tomato industry industry is a very big industry and a very popular one as well right so that is why we have to do everything possible to prevent this from getting into our country now these holes once you get holes on the plant or on the fruit it actually will cause secondary infections to come in after, which will further reduce the um, quality of the produce. Now, this pest has a high reproductive rate, having approximately 10 to 12 generations per year, right? So that means roughly in a month, the entire life cycle of this pest takes place. And the females can lay a lot of eggs, up to 260 eggs in her lifetime. So that tells you if you have one pest coming in into our country, in a matter of a month, you can have so many more of this um, tuta absoluta. Now, it's always good to know the life cycle of this pest. So once you know the life cycle, you're able to find the most destructive stage or the most vulnerable stage where you can actually deal with the issue. So like I said before, it has high reproductive potential and the biological cycle depends on the temperature. So this normally happens with most insects, warmer the conditions, faster the life cycle. So under optimal conditions, the moth is capable of over 10 generations per year. Now we would know for, with insects, they go through what we call complete metamorphosis of four developmental stages. So you have egg, larva, pupa, and adults, right? Now research will show you the complete life cycle takes 29 to 38 days depending on prevailing conditions. But like I said, if the conditions are hot, the life cycle could be shortened. So this is a general a picture just to show the life cycle basically. So once the eggs are laid, in three to five days, they hatch into larva. And this larva will feed for about 11 to 19 days, eating on leaves, the tips of your plant, into your flowers, into your fruits, but most importantly, the fruits, even your stems as well. Then after that 19 days or so, it goes into a rested stage or what we call the pupal stage. And that will last for about six to 10 days. And then they become the adult. Now, if you look at the, um, how long the adult lives, a male lives for about seven days, four to seven days, and the female lives for about 15 days, let's say about two weeks. But in two weeks time, the amount of devastation they can do, it's a lot. That is why, like I keep saying, we have to prevent it from getting into our country. Now, you don't need to go and look for this, but if you, you are curious, 
you could see the eyes if you have a um a, a hand lens and things like that you can actually see the eggs the eggs are usually cream white to yellow orange in color and then they turn a darker color after being hatched and they're very tiny as you see the diameter is about 0.3 to point, 0.2 to 3 in diameter so it's very tiny eggs are laid one by one or sometimes they are grouped together mainly on the underside of the young leaves near the veins or the margins and along the stalk and then sometimes you will may get them on the fruit but mainly it is on the leaves on the underside of the leaves now like we said before the eggs hatch in three to five days and then a female could produce approximately 260 eggs in, in its lifetime so this is blown up what it looks like but like i say it's very tiny the larval stage upon hatching when the eggs hatch the young larva pierces into the apical buds the apical buds those are the tips of the plant the shoots the flowers the leaves and even the young stems and fruits now it feeds on the mer meristomatic openings uh, um, tissue sorry and now if you look at a leaf you might think it is um thin like a sheet of paper but the mesophilic layer is actually the middle layer of the leaf. The leaf is made up of layers, right? Even though it looks like a thin sheet of paper. So in the middle layer is where you will have that lava feeding, causing those tunnels. And when it feeds, where you see that transparent tunnel, that is where it already feed, fed. It is not that the, the pest is there, right? Those are the symptoms of your pest. So the epidermis, is usually the top layer or the outer layers of the leaf. And that is where you see the symptoms. And the mesophyll, like I said, is the middle layer of the leaf, right? And as the pest feeds, it also de deposits its e excrements, which are the drop-ins. And usually it plugs the openings where it came in and where it is exiting. So it's a good way of actually picking up the, um, the pest, where you see the symptoms on it. And just like um, the life cycle, you also have a larval stage where a lab, the larval stage sorry, goes through four stages or what we call instars. So when it's about the fourth insta, it usually from the second to the fourth insta, it usually changes from a greenish color to a light pink color. And as it feeds, the color changes. The larval stage is the most destructive stage of this pest. That is the stage that does the most damage and like i said it feeds for about 12 to 15 days so in 15 days they could cause a lot of damage so this is a picture of what the larva looks like people call it caterpillar or worm but the correct terminology is a larva so it's green and it after as it feeds the color changes to a more pink type color the pupil stage which is the rested stage after the pest has fed so after the larval stage, it goes into this rested stage. And this pupa, usually it's covered in a silky white cocoon. And usually pupation can take place in the soil. So it can drop to the soil and the life cycle can continue. Or it can also take place on the leaves, the calyx. Let's say you have these plants in pots, it can take place under the pot, right? like in greenhouses and things like that, even the benches. So it can take place almost anywhere. Right? It can take place on the plant or in the soil or little um, apparatus that you may have around. And it takes about approximately six to 10 days for this pupa to go in to become the adult. So this is what it looks like. And then you have the adult emerging. Now the moths are silver, grayish, they have silver grayish scales with brown to black spots on its wings, right? That is how we identify it. But like I say, you cannot see this with your naked eyes. It has to be done under a microscope. Females are usually cream to brown and a little more bulky as compared to the male. That's if we are trying to um, sex whether it's male or female. Um, the length is usually five to seven millimeters, which is very tiny. That is less than a half of a, of a centimeter. The wingspan is about eight to 10 millimeters. Like we said, the male lives for about seven days and the female for about 15 days. And they mainly are active at night. So no one is coming out at night to find any of these insects, but they, they are active at night. 
and usually during the day they feed they feed sometimes they even hide between the leaves right when the sun is out so you can't really find them during the day so this is what tutor absolute looks like now, if you look at any pattern on it, like we said, it's kind of grayish. It has grayish scales, but you also get that type of brown and black spotting on the leaves. Now, like we said, because the insect is so tiny, because of the time that they feed, hardly likely you are able to find the adults. And this goes for most pests that you have, right? But what you see is the reaction of the pest, or what you call the symptomology, on your plant. So the first sign that you will see or symptom that you will you will identify would be this discoloration on the leaves of your tomato plant mm -hmm. or like we say peppers or melangin as well. Right. So you will have leaf mines which are trans transparent and then they turn brown to necrotic. Necrotic means looking type a rot. Right. We refer to this as a type of blotch. Right. A terminology that I use it looks like a blotch and I will show you what no our normal leaf miner looks like the ones that we have in Trinidad, and compare it to Tuta Absoluta. The leaf mines are usually found on the upper and even lower parts of the leaf lamina. Right, so this is to compare both. Now, the, no, the leaf miner that we have in Trinidad, if you look at the lower picture there, you see these thin lines, so these tunnels. Those are the transparent tunnels that we've been talking about. That tells you that you have leaf miners on your plant, or in your, the leaves of your plant. Whereas Tuta Absoluta, you get that wider, um, transparent look, or we call that blotch type look. So it's completely different. So if you are picking up any type of blotch on your plants, it's something that you need to report to your ministry, closest ministry's office so that we can actually do a visit to, to confirm whether it's Tuta Absoluta or not. In your fruits, you get present the presence of bore holes and mining under the sepals and usually you get heaps of granular excrements on the surface so if you look at the picture there the green tomato you're actually seeing the um, droppings on the fruit itself now i'm not going to go through this entire table but this it just it actually just compares tuta absoluta to the other two local species that we have in our country and like i keep saying we do not have a record that tuta absoluta is present in trinidad However, you have the other two, tomato pinworm and American serpentine leaf miner. Those are present in Trinidad. Now, leaf miners are something that don't only attack vegetables. For those who are into ornamental production, let's say you are growing um, ornamental plants, the foliage, where the foliage is uh, of beauty and of importance, you can also get leaf miner attacks on it. And that reduces the value of your crop. Right? So it's important not only for our farmers who are doing tomato and peppers, but also for the ornamental industry when it comes to leaf miners, that is. So these are the species that we have compared to the ones that, that we don't have. Two are absolute, like, like I said, we don't have. And the other two are the ones that we have in our country. But they're very tiny, like I keep saying. The lava also varies in terms of its color, how it's shaped, and things like that. But the symptomology is what is important and this is something we need to remember if we forget everything that i talk about today at least remember these pictures that blotchy type look where you see that spreading of the um transparent part of on the leaf that tells you it's tutor absoluta compared to the others where you get a smaller type of um blotch but more lines or tunnels that you will see on the leaves that tells you you have your normal it's the species of leaf miner that we have in our country now we do not have it in our country but how could it get into our country now in terms of its dispersal and this and spread of it now it can come into our country by infect infested fruits plants planting material packaging material used in trade because it could actually hitch on to these things and come into our country. When it gets into our country, it could be distributed within our country. When we have like, let's say our wholesale markets or places that repackage and redistribute commodities that come into our country. This mud, like I said from the beginning, can even fly or drift in the wind. Now these days, we everyone is talking about Sahara dust and that is coming from far distances into our country. So could you imagine 
Tuta Absoluta is present in Venezuela. It could even drift and come with the wind, right? So it's something that we need to look out for. If we pick it up in our fields, we need to report it, as I keep saying. But at present, as of 2021, end of 2021, Tuta Absoluta has not been recorded to be present in Trinidad. And why I quote 2021, I'll show you just now. Right, now the thing is, what is the research division doing with the, about the issue? What we have done thus far is we have been doing training of staff within the crop protection unit. And in 2020, we did conduct a border survey throughout our country. And no tutor absoluta was detected in Trinidad. Now, when we talk about we do um, surveys or surveillance activities, usually we set up traps at specific locations in our country. And on that trap, there is a pheromone. Pheromone is like a scent which can attract both the male and female insects from anywhere they are hiding. So usually the, um, the pheromones, they go a distance of almost two kilometers. So if you have this pest feeding anywhere within that vicinity of two kilometers, they will be attracted to that scent. They come to the trap and they are trapped. So they get, they get stuck on the trap. And routinely we will go and collect these traps and identify the insects that are on it. So in 2020, the staff of the crop protection unit was involved in doing a survey on the borders of our country. And we did not pick up tuta absoluta. Then in 2021, another survey was conducted, again with the crop protection unit. And this one was done in the field, in the farmer's field that are grow farmers that are growing solanaceous crops, tomatoes, peppers, melangin. And of as of 2021, like I said, no tutor absoluta was detected in Trinidad. Right? So the ministry is working, and this is a yearly thing that will be taking place to be able to pick up if it does come into our country. And then we also do continuous communication with other experts, international experts in this field. And there is already a national emergency response team in place. Should we pick up this in the field? What are the measures that need to take place immediately to contain this pest in that core area and eradicate it before it spreads? So the ministry is working. The research division is working, even though we may not see it, right? In the, months, in the months to come, as we are doing right now, we are doing awareness session with all the frontline officers of the ministry so that they will also be looking out within the fields for these um, symptoms. And we'll be setting up monitoring traps along the borders of Trinidad again, and also in the wholesale markets and ports of entry. Because anyway, cargo is coming in of plant-based products, tomato, pepper, melangin, potatoes. We need to have traps there should these pests, this pests come into our country. So what can you do? You have taken the time to listen to this presentation and we thank you for that, but there are some steps that you need to take to prevent it as well from getting into our country. The first thing, and the Crop Protection Unit always goes with a slogan, do not pack a pest. A lot of us, we know um, COVID is over, so people will um, start back travel in different parts of the world and that's your right to enjoy travel but when you go and you see these beautiful fruits vegetables and plants it's always tempting to bring back that into our country by bringing that into our country without a permit it is an illegal act that you are doing whether it is one fruit let's say it's one tomato that you're putting in your suitcase to bring back into trinidad or a container load is the same thing. You are breaking the law by bringing that into our country, right? If you do bring it into our country, you need to declare it at the borders, and obviously it will be seized because you will not have a permit for that, right? And you are doing that to pre we do that to prevent pests like this from getting into our country. Because if you remember, like what I mentioned before, the larval stage could be even in your fruit. The eggs could also be attached to your fruit and you don't even know that. You bring that into a country, you may use it, you may dump it, it goes into our landfills, you may even throw it behind your house or decide you're going to plant the seeds and things like that. You can get this pest getting into our environment. It will multiply and spread throughout our country. So do not bring in any illegal fruits or vegetables 
or any plant-based product into a country. There's a process if it is that you want to bring in something into a country. And usually the process is not when you reach any country, then you're going and you bring it in, then you're going to ask or apply for an import permit, right? You decide you are going to travel, you need to contact the plan quarantine unit of the Ministry of Agriculture Research Division and apply for an import permit. Right now, the import permit, it's free, but it's a process and everything is done online. You apply for this permit, you say the commodity, the amounts that you want to bring in and from which country. Usually once there are conditions in place for it, within three working days, you are able to get your import permit, right? And once you have that legal document, you are able to bring in your commodity, your plant-based product. If for some reason there are no conditions for that commodity from that country, you will be referred to the pest risk analysis unit where we have to do our research, it's like an assessment on that commodity from the country it is coming from and we develop the conditions or come up with the conditions which is given to you and then you are able to bring it into our country. So you are not supposed to bring in plant-based products into our country without that import permit. And finally, if you do pick up any symptoms of tuta absoluta in your garden, whether it's behind your house, you may have two tomato plants, or whether you have acres upon acres of tomato, right? The same um, process you will do, you will contact the closest ministry's office, agricultural office, that's your county office, um, or research division, or even ETIS, so different arms of the ministry, and we do a visit to confirm whether it's tutor absolute or not. We may even take a sample, right? So you can help to prevent this from getting into our country. So as I come to an end to my presentation, I would like to thank a number of key players to who made this possible. Firstly, my director, deputy directors, the officers of the um, research division, our lab staff, OJTs, officers in the counties, they were very helpful in assisting us in um, doing our surveys throughout our country, region administration, north and south, which makes up the um, eight counties. The USDA APHIS, this organization has funded the entire project or the entire survey for over the past two years to, man to um, do the survey on Tutor Absoluta in Trinidad. So we thank them very much. They were able to supply all the resources needed for these surveys. And very importantly, we would like to thank our farmers. Our farmers accommodated us in their fields, different days, different times, so that we can set up these traps, that we can service these traps. And if it wasn't for them, we would not, able, would not have been able to conduct this, these surveys successfully. So we thank them very much assisting us in doing this right now this ad was placed on the face our facebook page as you will know and a number of questions popped up outside of tutor absoluta so i decided to answer a few of them as we go along so number one one um question someone had or a few people they wanted to know you have leaf miner in your field how are you going to control it so this is a picture of what leaf miners look like the common ones that we keep saying. Now these um, adults, they actually live in the weeds or they hide in the weeds in your garden or in your field. So you need to control the weeds in and around your garden firstly, right? And secondly, then you need to apply a systemic insecticide with the active ingredients, abamectin, cypermetrin, or azadirectin, either or. Right now, the thing is, keywords there, especially when you're dealing with um, insecticides, systemic means it gets in the system of your plant, right? As compared to contact, contact means wherever the droplets fall, that is where it will do the killing. But systemic means it goes into the entire system from the root straight up until the tips of your plant, leaf, flowers, fruits. So that is very important when you're dealing with a pest like this. Remember we said in the leaf miners, whether it is tutor absoluta or the local leaf miners that we have in our country, they feed in the middle layers of your leaf. So if you apply a contact insecticide on the plant, it will not work. You need to get one that actually gets into the system of the plant so it kills the larva. And when you are going to buy your insecticides, you need to ask for a product that has 
either of these active ingredients, abomectin, cypermetrin, or azadirectin. And on a side note, once you're using agricultural chemicals, it is always important that you read and follow the instructions on the label. That is very important. That is why a label is there. You follow what is called the pre-harvest interval period. Now, they may not have the word pre-harvest interval, but they may have PHI. It means the same thing. Now, what is pre-harvest interval? Basically, it means if you apply the chemical on the plant today, how many days after is it safe to pick and consume the produce? The time frame between applying the chemical and when it is safer to pick the produce. Not pick the produce and leave it there, but pick the produce and able to consume it. That is that it's a time period when the plant would have used up the chemical. So your, the produce that you're going to harvest after is safer for consumption, right? Example, let's say you're using an insecticide and it says the pre-harvest interval is seven days, but you pick the fruit in three days time. If you do that, it means the fruit still has four days supply of chemical in it. If you consume that, that gets into your system, right? So you need to follow the pre-harvest interval. You always follow the rates or the dosage. It's like making a cake. If you are making a cake, you follow a recipe. You do not add, when they say add one tablespoon of salt, you don't add five, right? And that is something that you will do when you're using chemicals as well. If they say the rate is a teaspoon to a gallon of water, you follow the rate. More in this case does not mean it will work better. It will actually do the opposite. And once you're using agricultural chemicals, you always wear protective gears. That is very important. Another question, very popular when it comes to tomato. Um, a lot of people get something called blossom end rot. Now, if you look at the picture there, you are actually seeing this type of this circular rot, this brown to black color on the underneath of the fruit. Nowhere else on the underneath of the fruit. Once it's on the underneath of the fruit, it's something called blossom end rot. If you get it on the sides of the fruits and things like that, that is usually anthracnose or other diseases. But once it's on the underside of your fruit, it is something called blossom end rot. And that is caused because of a lack of calcium. The plant is not getting enough calcium. In humans, you will say that you get brittle bones and things like that if you have if you are lacking calcium. In this case, you get that rotted area on the underside of your fruits. So when you see that, there's nothing you can do at that stage. But you have to do preventative measures to prevent your produce from getting that. And how do you do that? When you're doing your land preparation or you're mixing a soil mix to fill in a pot to plant your tomato crop, it also happens in melon gin at times, you, but you get it a lot in um, watermelons too. So you get it in different crops, but in particular, you get it in tomato. You need to add limestone to the land. You mix limestone into the land or into the soil, and then you plant your crop. Limestone has calcium in it and it helps. As the crop is growing, you need to use growing fertilizers that contain calcium in it. And most importantly, you need to water your plants regularly, especially now we are in a dry season. A lot of times the calcium is in the soil, but because you do not have the moisture to take for the plant to take up the nutrients, it cannot get into the system of your plant. So you need to water your plants. Now, tomato is a crop that must be watered every single day. If you don't, and the soil dries out for a day or two, you will get blossom end rot later on in your fruits. So I always, we always tell farmers, if you decide to plant tomato, before you decide to invest in the seedlings, you need to invest in a water supply. Whether you are digging a pond, whether you are bringing in water via tank or, what, or things like that, you need to have a proper water source before you get into tomato production. If you do not have a water source, do not grow tomato. You will lose the crop to blossom and rot. Now, because this plant is affected, um, like I say, a lack of calcium, all the affected fruits, you need to remove it from the plant so you have less fruits that need calcium. So you will allow the younger ones to develop. And if you follow, like what I said before, water regularly and use your calcium fertilizers, the younger fruits may not have blossom and rot. Another one is you usually get your fruits cracking. So 
when you see your fruits cracking, what is causing it to crack? Now, this doesn't only happen to tomato, you can get it in other fruits as well. Cracking is caused mainly because of inconsistency of moisture in the fruit. So let's say you get very, a few days of very dry conditions and the soil dries out very fast and then you get a shower rainfall or you water your plant after a few days. What happens is the plant went on under stress. So the plant thought I'm going to die. So as it gets the moisture, it takes a lot of the moisture and it sends it to the most economical part of your plant, which are the fruits. And the speed of water going to the fruits and the amount of water that goes into the fruits, it causes the cells in your fruit to burst or what you call, or we say splits. And that is how you get splitting of your fruits. So yes, you may have calcium, uh, calcium issues also um, prevent that. So if it is you are adding your limestone, you are fertilizing with calcium, but you need to water your plant regularly. So to prevent calcium, to prevent cracking, sorry, you need to water your plants regularly. And like I said, tomato should be watered every single day. Once the soil dries out, you run the risk of getting cracking and you also run the risk of getting blossom and rot. So that was a little snapshot of some of the questions. Now I have a few others here. Right. So once someone asks about um, getting land and things like that, you can you, um, how are you able to get a land or even how to get um, a, a, a farmer's badge? Now you contact your closest agricultural office, your county office, and there are guidelines to follow. They will tell you what you need, what documents you need to bring in in order to get a farmer's card. If you can't get a farmer's card, there's something called a buffer card, which you can also get. Now, Tuta Absoluta has never been an issue in Trinidad. Like I said, we don't have it in Trinidad. But once it enters a country, and I mentioned the countries before, Right. Once I, um, it gets in the country, it spreads very fast. Right. And a lot of resources has to go in to try to manage it and even control it. So it has not been a problem in Trinidad because we do not have it. That is why we do routine service um, surveillance. Right now, tutor absolute, like we say, it's specific for tomato, peppers, melon gin, and well, we don't really have Irish potato in our Trinidad in Trinidad. Right. But the thing is, you have normal leaf, those other species of leaf miners that attack, like I said, your ornamental plants. Some some people say you can sit on your citrus plants and things like that. How are you going to control it? As we recap, you control the weeds in your field. That's the first thing that you need to do. And then you need to apply your systemic insecticides, right? Act with the active ingredient, abamectin, cypermetrin, and azadirectin. Once you apply this, and these are systemic insecticides, so you can apply it onto the tree with a spray can or a mist blower, or you can even apply it on the soil underneath the tree, and the root system will take up the chemical and it will go and it will actually kill the larval stage of the insect that is present in the plant, in the leaves, and things like that. Right? So, at present, like I said, our phone lines are not working. They are not functional right now. So should you decide to get, um, you need to get in contact with the research division, you can contact us via email, and that's our email address there. And feel free to send your questions even on Facebook, just as you are viewing right now. You can even send your questions on Facebook and it will be forwarded to us. So as we come to an end to our session today, I would like to thank you all very much for tuning in and also for keeping up with us as we went through a number of sessions before every Tuesday from 12 noon, where we try to bring a little bit of what we do to your homes, to your offices and things like that. So you know now that the research division in particular is doing a lot, even though we don't see it outside there. A lot of things are happening behind the scenes to literally protect our borders from pests and diseases entering our country. So thank you all very much and do have a good day.